Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Well, it is great to see you. Uh, thank you for being here. Welcome to North Shore. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, I'm Wolfgang. Uh, I work here. And uh, welcome. Thanks for being with us, either online, of course, or uh, right here in the room. You know, one thing, and all kinds of different backgrounds and all, but I think one thing most of us would agree with, no one likes to feel duped. You know what I mean? Like when you feel like somebody just tricks you or fools you or scams you, that's like one of the worst feelings in the world, isn't it? Now, sometimes it's no big deal. Sometimes it's something minor. Like, for instance, every single year, it seems, on the 1st of April, someone jumps onto social media and announces that In-N-Out Burgers is going to be putting a new location in the greater Seattle area, right? You've seen that year over year. And there are people underneath that just get all excited. Oh, I can't wait to double, double, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. Until people put the math together and they're, oh, wait, 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 wait. It's April Fool's Day, right? Oh, I can't believe they got me again this year, right? But then there are far more serious examples of this, and many of you maybe have even haven't had this experience. There's that email that looks so legit, right? How do they make it look so legit? And they just say they need a few little details from us to be able to complete the transaction or to make the delivery, and so you click the link, right? And all of a sudden, there's malware installed that suddenly grabs your personal information and gets all your private material and all this stuff, and you've been scammed. Or someone reaches out to you and say they're a family member or uh, someone that you love or a friend who just says, hey, I have this need. Would you be willing to help me out? All you need to do is go to the grocery store, buy a gift card, just send me the numbers so that I can uh, get it. But It's a crisis situation. Don't say anything to anyone else. I'm a little embarrassed, but can you help me out? Yeah? I know people who've fallen for that. Or, of course, there's the old Nigerian prince, right? Who somewhere along the line has come into this massive oil fortune that he just doesn't feel good about the bank there in Nigeria. So what he wants to do is transfer it to some stable, safe American bank, and he's just looking for someone, maybe you, who would like to help just by simply giving them your, he'd be happy to say thank you with a wonderful gift of thousands and tens of thousands of dollars. All you have to do is reply with your routing number, your bank account, and your mother's maiden name, right? You know what's crazy? As much as these things have been around forever, we joke about them, we hear about them. Last year alone, according to the FBI, I read this whole report, $12.5 billion dollars stolen by these kinds of scams. 12.5 billion with a B. Even the Nigerian prince is still making six figures every single year. People falling for that same, the same old lie. It's one of the worst, nobody likes to be scammed. And as common and as harmful as some of those things can be, some of you know firsthand, can I just tell you, there's another kind of scam that's even more widespread even more destructive. It lures you in with promises it can never deliver on. Promises it can't keep. Always too good to be true. And it's a scam run by the original con artist. The OG scammer, right? And he's been pulling it off literally since the dawn of time. Scripture calls him the tempter or the accuser, or the devil, or Satan. And just as scripture says, there's a God who loves us, who sees us, who knows us, who is for us, a God who wants to give us life, as Jesus said, life to the full, it also says there is an enemy, one that Jesus described, whose whole goal and objective in his existence is to steal, kill, and destroy a master scammer. And in this text that we're looking at today, John gives us a little peek into this scammer's playbook. 
He names three things that people have been falling for from the very dawn of humanity. That every single human being, no matter what you believe, no matter what your background, every single human being, myself included, we all deal with pretty much every single day. It's one thing you can say about Satan. He is entirely predictable, right? He does not have any new temptations. He has been using the same basic three in various forms for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. They're they're the same three that he used to entice Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. He used them on Abraham. He used them on Moses, David, Jeremiah. He even used them on Jesus. The same three temptations. And they're the same three temptations that every single one of us is going to deal with every day of our lives. John names them in today's passage. And of course, remember, this is the same John who wrote other books in the New Testament. He is the one who wrote the Gospel of John as one of Jesus' Jesus' closest followers during Jesus' life, recorded the life of Christ for us in the Gospel of John. He then was also the one that received the miraculous revelation that we read about at the end of the New Testament. But you'll remember in one of John's other books, in the Gospel of John, he writes perhaps the most famous verse in all the Bible, John 3, 16. What's he say? He says, God so loved the world, right, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world be saved through him. But it opens with, for God so loved the world, John three sixteen. But then, the verse we're looking at today, same John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, he says, do not love the world. So which is it? God so loved the world, do not love the world. Which one is it? Well, of course, it depends on what you mean by the word world, of course. We are to love the people of the world. When, when John 3.16, for God so loved the world, is talking about he loved the people of the world. But 1 John 2 is talking about the value system of the world. We're to love the people of the world, but we're to hate and resist the value system of the world. Here's the problem, though. A lot of times, we do the exact opposite, right? Sometimes, let's be honest, we kind of hate the people of the world, and we find ourselves quietly embracing the value system of the world. We find our priorities and our goals pretty much resemble the priorities and goals of everybody else. Right? It's just the water we swim in, the current that everyone's riding. And John says to these early followers of Jesus, you want to experience the life that Jesus has for you, this unburdened life that he's designed us to live? Then don't fall for this value system of the world. Don't don't let it set the agenda for your life because it offers satisfaction and happiness that is short-lived and shallow. This world system, it writes checks it cannot cash. It's a scam. So don't be duped. So what's this world's value system? How does John describe it? Well, we already heard it, but let's look at it again. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. He writes, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, And the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. John says there's this tug of war that is going on all around us. Unseen spiritual forces that are battling for our attention and for our affection. Pulling on us. On one side, the ways of the world with its value system and its priorities And then on the other side, the ways of God. They don't mix. They're oil and water. They pull against each other. These ways of the world are everywhere you look. In fact, if you think about them and you really analyze, every commercial or advertisement you've ever seen is built on one of these three values. The first one he calls the lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh is the temptation to feel. To feel. I just want to feel good. I just need a break, man. I just need to feel good for a second, right? And it's not just about sex. It's about even more than that. Could be entertainment. Could be Netflix. Could be uh, your favorite news network. It could be sports. It could be whatever. It could be food. 
Uh, could be alcohol, could be cannabis or some other drug maybe. It could be any kind of pleasure. I just need to, I just need to feel, I don't care if it's right or wrong, I just need to feel, feel good right now. Whatever it takes. That's the lust of the flesh. I want to feel good, the temptation to feel. Next one is the lust of the eyes. The lust of the eyes is the temptation to have. I see it, I want it. The lust of the eyes, it's greed, it's, it's envy, it's materialism. If the lust of the flesh is about passion and pleasure, the lust of the eyes is about possessions. What do I own? I see these things in this world and I want them. In fact, I deserve them. The temptation to have is to think the opposite of what Jesus said when he said in Luke 12, life does not consist in an abundance of possessions, Jesus said. That's not the secret of life, he says. The temptation, the, the lust of the, the eyes would say baloney. My life is defined by how nice my car is, how big my house is, how good my clothes are. That's what life is ultimately about, according to the lust of the eyes. So the lust of the flesh is about passion and pleasure. The lust of the eye, I'm sorry, the lust of the flesh about passion and pleasure. The lust of the eyes is about possessions. And the last of these three is the pride of life, pride. Pride, that's the temptation to be, right? To be admired, to be impressive. I wanna be known. I want people to, to think that I'm better than them, right? This is under this umbrella would be things like gossip. Well, I'll feel better if I tear them down. That's pride. Or judgmentalism. I feel better than them because I don't do what they do. That's pride. It's the pride of life. It's the temptation to be. It's, it's pleasure, possessions, and position, right? It's the temptation to indulge, to increase, and to impress. Every single advertisement you've ever seen appeals to at least one of these three temptations. Have it your way, right? You deserve the best. You're worth it, right? You're nothing till you get this product, right? These temptations, they promise fulfillment, they promise satisfaction, and they might give a little bit of good for a little bit of time. But as John says, they pass away. They don't Last, they leave us hungry or thirsty or wanting. Instead of lifting our burdens in life as we hope that they will just to give us a little bit of a break, what do they do? They instead load us down with even more burdens. And I'm not kidding when I say these go back to the very dawn of humanity, the very first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. When Adam and Eve are tempted in the garden in Genesis 3, this tempter makes his debut and he points he steers their attention to the one tree in this massive garden that they're not supposed to eat. Millions of trees. No shortage of tree options. It's not like God said, you can't eat these 90%, you can only eat from these 10%. No, 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 no. All the trees in the garden, millions to select from, all yours, fair game. Just one, though. This one, I want you to leave it alone. It's out of bounds. And of course, human nature, which one do we go to, Right? And so the enemy comes, and he says, did, did God really say you can't eat that? Maybe you're misinterpreting that. Maybe there's another explanation. Maybe it's cultural. Did God really say that? I'm paraphrasing here. You know what it is. God's holding out on you. Because he knows if you eat that, that you'll become like him. It's really not that big a deal anyway. You won't die, he says. Not that big a deal. And you notice, Satan's temptation is never to be like Satan, right? He never says, you do this and you'll be like me. He's much smarter than that. He says, you do this, you'll be like God. Who doesn't want to be in control, right? And after all, why would God make you that way? With that craving, that longing, that desire, if he didn't want you to satisfy it. So if it feels good... Do it. What's the big deal? If you want it, you should have it. If it helps you get ahead, but by all means, go for it. So look at what happens. After this lure, this scam is set up, chapter 3, verse 6 of 
Genesis. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave to her, some to her husband, who was with her. He's standing right there. And he ate it. You notice the three? Do you see him in there? The same exact three. First, she saw the tree was good for food. Another translation, it looked delicious. Oh, I bet that's tasty. It's pride of flesh, or less of the flesh. And then the other one, it's pleasing to the eye. Oh, it looked beautiful. It's so shiny. How do they do that, right? It's the lust of the eyes. And then finally, it was desirable for gaining wisdom, exactly the same. In other words, if we eat this, we'll be like God. It's pride of life. Because we all want to be like God. We want to control our world. Everyone does. Which, by the way, of course, is why you're so stressed all the time. Because you're not God. And you're never going to be God. There's these basic same three temptations. I deal with them all the time, every single day. So do you. So do you. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. They're the exact same temptations that this same tempter tried to use on Jesus. Well, look at this quickly. After Jesus was baptized, he went, uh, was led by the Spirit to be tempted by the devil. Some of you know that story. And even, so keep that in mind, even Jesus was tempted, okay? Same temptations. As he was fasting in the wilderness, look what happened. This is over in Matthew chapter 4. It says, Jesus answered in uh, Matthew 4, Jesus answered, I'm sorry, Jump up to verse two. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus was hungry. That's like the understatement of all time, right? Right there. Verse three, the tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Verse four, Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So here's Jesus, 40 days, nothing to eat. Is there anything wrong with Jesus eating? Of course not. Jesus ate all the time. Temptations, they often come to these natural urges that we want to try to satisfy in, in unhealthy ways. There's nothing wrong with being hungry. What's the temptation here? What's this lust of the flesh? It's to satisfy yourself physically. And the problem here is that the enemy's trying to get Jesus to turn these stones to bread, to, to use his abilities purely to satisfy his own desire, right? Not for the benefit of others. That's why God gave Jesus all that power. That's why Jesus had that power, is to, for the benefit of others, that healing and all that stuff we see. Satan's tempting him to use that stuff just for himself. Satisfy yourself, feed yourself, use your gifts to meet your needs because you deserve a little pleasure, man. You earned it. Indulge. Turn these stones into breath. Feed bread. Feed the, the lust of the flesh. Then comes the next temptation. Jump in. Uh, verse five. It says, then the devil took Jesus to the holy city, had him stand on the highest point in the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift up their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. The devil quotes the Bible here. Isn't this great? Verse 7. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. So Jesus, I got this great idea. I know you know, If you threw yourself off this high point and angels came down to catch you, that's going to wow a crowd. Those people will worship you. They will know that you're somebody special. So why don't you do it? Now, is there something wrong with Jesus being worshipped? Of course not. It's just that God's idea for Jesus is to be worshipped by dying on a cross, not by showing off his power. It's the pride of life. It's, it's to be spectacular. It's to impress. It's to wow people. Look how successful. Look at my amazing social media accounts. Right? The vacations I take. How successful my kids are. Look at me. Envy me. It's pride of life. Third temptation, verse 8. Again, the devil took Jesus to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. Verse 10, Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. You see all that splendor? You see all those riches out there? They're impressive, aren't they? You want them? All you gotta do is cut a corner. Just a little compromise. One little moment no one needs to see. Cut the corner. You can have it all. The easy way, the fast way. It's the lust of the eyes. Do you see how these show up over and over again? 
These are the values of the world. This is the current we're all swimming in, friends. And John writes, it's a scam. It promises things it can't deliver. It offers fulfillment that will never pay out. Sounds like it will satisfy, but always too good to be true. They'll only ever weigh you down with the kind of guilt and regret that we talked about last weekend. It won't lift, it, won't, it doesn't fit with this unburdened life that God has in mind for us. So don't be duped. Here's the bottom line. I gotta keep moving. If, if these If these temptations are the ones that work to bring down Adam and Eve, and they're the big guns that the enemy brought out to attack Jesus himself, you can be pretty darn sure he's gonna come at you with the same stuff. He's gonna come at me with the same stuff, he does. The details might be different, the nature of the temptation may be a little different for each person, but that temptation for pleasure, possessions, and position, that temptation to indulge, to increase, to impress, They're all around us. You'll encounter them all the time. And they're always pulling at our hearts. John is saying, don't let that define your life. Expect them. Don't be surprised when that phishing email shows up in your inbox. Learn to recognize the signs of this so you don't click on that stupid link, right? Recognize it so you don't fall for it, so you're not duped. Have a plan when they come. So what's the plan? Well, some people say, well, that's easy. I know exactly what I need to do. I need to try harder. Like when those temptations come or I feel myself drawn toward, I gotta dig way down deep in my willpower. I gotta gotta resolve, I will not do that thing again. I will not judge that person. I will not get angry. I will not lose my temper. I will not look in that person that way. I will not, I, I just won't do it. I'm gonna dig down deep. Well, the only problem with willpower is it's a diminishing asset, isn't it? Am I the only one who deals with that? Where it fades It has a way of drifting. It's not about digging deeper and trying harder, right? Maybe there's a different way. Maybe there's a different way. Maybe this way, instead of focusing so hard on the things that we don't want, I'm not gonna do that, I'm not gonna do that. What if we instead said, I'm gonna focus on the things I do want? Let me explain it this way. If you step into the world of recovery, let's say, the goal is not to stop drinking, It's to become a person who doesn't drink. Do you see the difference? It's not just to stop a behavior. It's to become a different person. One who doesn't do that kind of thing. Because you've changed. So the same idea applies. It's not so much about stopping those impulses toward pleasure. It's saying, I want to become a person of integrity. It's not so much stopping those impulses toward um, impressing people and having things. No, I want to become a person of generosity, a person of humility. It's not so much what I don't want to be, it's who I do want to be. Do you see the difference? Instead of saying, I'm going to stop doing these things, it's saying, I'm going to become a person who doesn't do those things. And it may not seem like a big difference to you, but can I tell you, friends, it's all the difference in the world. All the difference. Because one is about trying harder. The other is about training ourselves to become a different kind of person, the kind of person that John is inviting us to be in this beautiful little letter, a person whose life is built around the way of Jesus. I think that's what the Apostle Paul, another New Testament writer, I think that's what he's getting at, the same idea when he writes this in Romans chapter 12, verse two. He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. One translation puts it this way. Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. There's a, there's a mold in our world, isn't there, of what life's about and what matters and what you ought to be chasing and how you define if you're worth it or not. He says, don't fall for that. Don't let this world squeeze you into that mold. Both Paul and John are saying the exact same thing. Don't let the values of this world shape you because we're all being formed. We're all being shaped every day because all around us are influences that are telling us what matters, what life is about, what we should prioritize. We are all being formed. Think of it this way. Think of it this way. Mother Teresa was spiritually formed but so was Adolf Hitler. 
They're just formed by different influences, different values. So the question is not, are you being formed? It's who or what are you being formed into? Does this make any sense? So I guess the question is, are you being intentional about the people and the environments and the experiences and the practices that will help form you into the person God is calling you to be? Because can I tell you, there is no such thing as an accidental saint. You will not stumble into it, okay? You will not just wake up one day and suddenly realize to yourself, well, you look at that. I'm shaving with a saint this morning, right? That will not happen. Here I am, I'm suddenly free of worry. I don't feel an ounce of judgmentalism or fear or anger or lust. I am suddenly filled with this freakish love and concern for others, even my enemies. It just happened overnight, can you believe it, right? It does not work that way, friends. I know people who are waiting for that. It will never happen. You're gonna wait a long time. Because becoming people of love and joy and peace is not a zap experience. Becoming people of integrity and generosity and humility, it is a process. It is being transformed, as Paul says, through people and experiences and practices that help form us in a physiological way, very literally when it comes to wiring in our brains. Forming us after the example of Jesus. That's why a key piece of each of these uh, series weeks has been a featured practice that people have used throughout the centuries to grow as followers of Jesus. And if you were here last week, you heard Scotty with that amazing message about confession. That acknowledging our failures and sins. And maybe some of you engaged in that practice. You went to the website like we encourage you to do and there's this ancient template of prayer called prayer of examine where you kind of reviewed your day and did an honest assessment. What things in my life are drawing me closer to God? What things are drawing me farther away? Maybe some of you did that or you gave that some thought and maybe you even reached out to a friend or somebody you trust and said, here's what I'm learning, what are you learning? There is something so powerful about telling the truth to ourselves, to God, and to others. God uses that to rewire us, to transform us. And this week, I want to invite you to experiment with another ancient practice, one that's sort of fallen out of favor except in some in the diet industry. It's actually a practice that Jesus himself used very religiously, if you pardon the expression. His earliest followers did it for centuries since. People have been doing this as part of their formation after Jesus. It's that practice of fasting. It's intentionally going without something, denying our natural impulses or appetites to instead focus on the presence and the provision of God. You know, often people, when they think of fasting, they automatically jump straight to food, and that can be part of it, skipping a meal, series of meals perhaps, but you can fast in other ways too. Frankly, in our culture, some that might be even harder. Because I know people who are happy to skip a meal, but if you told them, why don't you put your phone in a drawer for three hours, they'd start to twitch. Right? Because <sighs> how many times have I turned around and gone home? Because I forgot it. And I don't think I can make it a day without it. Right? I'm the only one, I'm sure. But what if you said, you know what? I'm going to try a digital fast. For half a day today, I'm going to put the phone aside. For this whole week, I'm going to turn it off, change the voicemail. Thank you for your call. My phone is out of commission this week. If you need me desperately, here's a number you can use to reach me. Give it to a friend or a neighbor or somebody that can get to you. I know some, I'll skip the meal. I'll skip the meal, right? I mean, that sounds a lot easier, right? But what if we made those kinds of intentional choices to sort of begin to craft our souls, put ourselves in places where we're open to hear from God or focus our attention on him? Do you see what I'm talking about? It's training ourselves to not be driven by cravings or appetites. And it can play out in so many different ways. And so there on the website at northshore.church slash practices, you'll see very practical steps on some suggestions on how to do this. You can do this. What might happen if you do? Why don't you find out? Try it. Now you might think, whoa, 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 whoa. I thought this series was called The Unburdened Life. Putting down my phone or skipping a meal feels very burdensome to me. And I get that. But here's the irony. 
As we incorporate practices like this into our lives, don't we ironically find ourselves actually a little more free? More free maybe from the comparison and the jealousy that is so easy to slip into as you scroll through social media? More free from the fear and the outrage that's being peddled by news outlets on both sides of the political spectrum? More free by not being a slave to every little itch or impulse that I ever feel? By throwing off that dead weight and being transformed, we begin to experience the life that is truly life. And so here's my question, my challenge. We can conform, we can go right along with the values of this world, and quite frankly, that takes no effort at all because that current is more than happy to just sweep you along like it does for so many. Or you will make a decision intentionally to be transformed, to go against that flow, to have our values remade after the example of Jesus. Why? Because friends, I just tell you straight up, and many of us know this because we've gone way down this road, this world and its values, this lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life, they will never deliver what they promise. They only wind up leaving us more burdened. And can we just say it out loud? There is no Nigerian prince prepared to give you some windfall magically. It ain't gonna happen. It's a lie. He doesn't have your best interests in mind. Jesus says all he cares about is lie, kill, and destroy. But can I tell you, there is another king that you can trust who wants nothing but the best for you. And his name is King Jesus. And he has come so that you can have life and have it to the full. No tricks, just love. Sacrificing himself for you and for me. Can I ask you, which king do you want to put your trust in? Bow your head with me. Let's, let's pray about some of this because, God, this is more than we can do on our own. And so I want to thank you first, Lord, for your incredible grace. I thank you for looking out for us. I believe it breaks your heart when we get duped too. And so, Father, we thank you. And, God, some of us, maybe in this moment, we just, we need to kind of draft off what we talked about last week with a little bit of confession. I mean, maybe we've justified for whatever reason, either thinking, oh, maybe God didn't really say that or he didn't really mean that or I'm entitled to this or this is what everybody does. Whatever the rationalization, to rationalize is to just rationalize. God, will you set us free? Would you give us the courage to just confess before you it's sin? It has no place in our lives. It's destructive, it's corrosive, it's contagious, it's contaminating. So God, set us free. We lay it down before you. And we ask that you will mold our hearts after yours, that you will make us more and more like Jesus, to become like Jesus. Show us your ways, because only you satisfy those deepest hungers in all of us. So strip all that other stuff away, I pray, in the name of Jesus. And right now the band's gonna lead us in a brand new song. And this one, you can just kinda sit and focus in on the lyrics, maybe just see if these lyrics could be a prayer you'd wanna pray. And then if you want, join in. But they're gonna lead us through this time to just maybe there's some business you need to do with God, just inviting him into some places where you know you need him. So uh, let's, let's pray to him this way.